<laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, later on we'll go on to um, the employability side of things and uh, have a little bit of a chat about sort of what modules I, I, I did and, and how I, you know, got to where I am now. So that will all come. Um, but obviously for the sort of the first 20 minutes, half an hour or so, um, you know, I'll, I'll have a bit of chat about my job and, and what I do at the council, um, a bit about sort of what the team does as well. Um, I have, I only started in September, um, so so a lot of this is fairly new still to me, but I have sort of been thrust straight in, if you like, um, and, uh, you know, the, the natural processes that occur at the coast, obviously they don't stop for when I've started my job, so that is um, a real interesting part of it is, is, you know, managing the natural environment is is is, is ongoing and, and always happening. So any questions do ask right at the end. I've got sort of two separate sections to ask lots of questions. So if you want to, to think of anything, um, please, please do ask anything really. Um, and even about, you know, the employability side of things, you make it as personal as you want. Obviously, you know, being an ex-graduate, I think, um, you know, asking those questions are really, really important. Um, well, I'll have a little bit of chat about uh, the team. I think that's important because I think for a lot of us um, and for some of you, you know, sort of on the call, it might be that actually the coastal side isn't what you want to do. Um, and it might be that actually there's another element of what um, our team does that you find really interesting. And I think, again, I'll just sort of highlight the different roles that, that people have just within our team of, of 11. Um, you know, the council's tens of thousands of people that work there. So to actually see that you know there's a, a team of 11 and then there's actually quite a lot more it shows actually there's a lot of opportunity um i think the work we'll go through uh, briefly that just about what the things we're doing at the moment um obviously that's changing all the time um have a little bit of chat about coastal management in the east riding itself um the future um of the east Riding coastline just sort of very briefly about what could happen for us um, within the council and then we'll go on to some sort of questions as well um I do want to say you know, this is a brief overview of, of the work that's undertaken. Um, you know, the council is, is huge, you know, the, the, the number of people that work there, the number of teams that are involved, not just within the coastal itself, but obviously all the different elements of the environment. It is massive. And this is just a brief overview, sort of a simplified version, if you like, of all the work that we do. So hopefully you sort of get a nice understanding of, um, of my job and my role and, and how sort of I play a part in, in managing managing the coastline. So this is this is our team. Um, and I think there's lots of different roles here. There's lots of different backgrounds, people from various different degrees. Um, and I would say even within our team, we have three ex geography, three people who all went to university, have all done geography, and have come out and are now doing something within that role. So I think that's something to highlight. Um, there's also a nice background of people with sort of marine, um, marine backgrounds, um, sort of biology and things like that. Uh, some people with history backgrounds as well. So there's quite a varied mix of people. Um, the, the roles change all the time as well. So what you see here, you know, it could be that in two years time, that role is completely different, it has a different name, it has a different focus. But obviously the whole of, of our team are working towards sort of a sustainable future, something that's greener and cleaner, um, you know, managing the environment and, and I think this, you know, hopefully gives you a bit of a, an idea that actually there's lots of different roles out there just within in the sustainable development team um, uh, on its own. OK. So in terms of what we do as a team, well, you know, it changes all the time, really varied, really interesting. There's some great pieces of work that people do, some stuff that makes it into national news, some people um, even recently just Started this year, we're, we're on um, things like Look North and, and ITV because what we do is really, really important. You know, we're trying to manage the, the natural environment in a way that obviously helps towards the you know, sustainable future. So that might be non native species, um, particularly invasive non native species, um, and that's within the coast, within rivers, within fields. It's absolutely everywhere, and that's a real big part of biodiversity officers' um, role. Um, so that's um, a big piece of work that they're constantly doing, always getting calls about invasive non-native species. I think, it, you know, when it comes to what's happening right now, you know, I can't not mention climate change. And it is probably the biggest piece of work that our team will undertake in the next probably two to five years. Um, I think it, it's got to be said that 
nearly every single company out there, whatever type of work they do, they have someone involved in climate change. And that's within schools, that's within um, local authorities, that's within any business you can think of now are starting to really think about climate change. And for us, it's a massive, massive piece of work. So a lot of local authorities have recently actually declared sort of a climate emergency. So they're sort of now thinking about how they can improve their, all their services and, and, and work towards a, a you know a sort of a, a greener future in even by 2030. Um, and we're the same. We're sort of now starting to review all the different policies and the different strategies that we have and the services and how we sort of can make those a bit more um, efficient and, and work towards sort of the idea of, of, sort of net zero. Um, so that's a huge piece of work. I will be involved in that slightly, but not so much because we do have sort of a climate change officer role um, specifically dedicated to that. You have uh, a couple of officers as well who are sort of partnership workers. So they work with LEP, so local enterprise partnerships and local nature partnerships as well. So they um, work heavily with sort of the local community, um, particularly in areas that bring people together to sort of use the natural environment. Um, so you might have, have done a bit about things like natural capital. Um, again, that's a big part of their roles. And we have um, one for um, Hull and East Yorkshire. We have one for the North Yorkshire and we have a marine um, partnership officer as well. So lots of different um, people coming together to effectively promote um, the environment and how to use it and, and the best way of, of working um, in the environment as well. We also have um, a couple of officers who um, look at things like uh, recreational disturbance. So it might be drones, it might be boats, uh, it might be jet skis and fishing and, and anything that actually happens along the coastline. Um, I think because the East Riding's got such a buried coastline, which I'll sort of come on to in a second, um, it can be you know, a big, big issue. And there's lots and lots of visitors and, and people come from you know, all around the, the, the country um, so actually having a, an officer there to, to sort of support and protect those environments is really, really important. And recreational disturbance is, is, is huge now, absolutely massive. I mean, last year alone, you know, they had hundreds of people coming on, on jet skis from up and down the country, basically. Um, and, and they were just sort of going out. And a lot of these sites are protected because of birds and because of the marine wildlife. So really, really important role. Um, you know, that's, again, going to be something that's I think pushed within the government as well is, is how to manage this because it has become a real issue, particularly since um, since last year. So we do get puffins at uh, Flamborough Head, um, which some of you may may have seen, some of you may have been to. Um, and again, they're you know they're part of just a number of different species that live there. That you know without this this effort and support from police and, and other wildlife organizations you know they they would be they would be under threat so it is really really quite an important role to get some of these species that live there and then there's actually my role um, and, and a few others who sort of work with the, sort of the local communities um, and it's a massive engagement side of things and, and working with um, those communities who are affected by risk and that might be flooding that might be coastal erosion for me it's particularly coastal erosion and coastal flooding so for a lot of these communities, they, they need the support and they need to know sort of what to do next. And obviously I'll come on to that um, shortly as to, to how we sort of do that as a local authority. For I think many people, if you've not been to the coastline um, of the East Riding, um, I mean, from a map, it looks fairly quite straightforward. It's quite a straight line um, and that's about it. But actually, you know, it's really, really complex. It's probably one of the most diverse coastlines that you know we have in the entirety of the UK. Um, there's around about 19, 20 kilometers of chalk headland at Flamborough Head. Really, really important site. It's internationally designated. There's SPAs, there's SACs, there's triple SIs, there's absolutely everything. Everything you can think of that has been designated is at Flamborough Head. And there's so much there that it, it really does need protecting. And, and there's a number of people who work really, really carefully um, to keep that, that those sites managed really well because, you know, it gets a lot of visitors. So that's a really important place along the East Riding that, uh, again, you know, it's it's something that that needs to be constantly managed, constantly reviewed. And we've got management plans in place. Um, and, and RSPB Bempton Cliffs, you've probably heard of it, is, is located at Flamborough, Flamborough Head. And again, you know, it gets sort of upwards of sort of a few, you know, hundred thousand people a year 
um, and so important to to the local area and the the, the local um, the local economy as well. So um, really important to keep that going. We've also got some sand dunes down at Spurn, so there's a, a sand spit um, right down at the end, again formed sort of by the, the natural process of erosion, um, but again internationally designated because of the habitats that are live there. Um, so again, it's really important that the management of that that area, that that coastline, um, is is done in a way that's um, promoting the natural environment and, and isn't just allowing it to sort of erode and, and to be left. We've then got around about 11 kilometres of defended frontages. So some of these, uh, the big towns and the resorts at Wednesday Hall and Wilmington, there's a few other sort of localised um, defended areas as well. But again, really important to keep those managed and keep those going because they're a huge boost to the local economy um, and thousands of tourists each year. But, you know, for the majority of it, it is undefended. It's eroding at quite a rapid rate. Uh, we get really large waves that come from the northeast and um, that travel sort of upwards of seven, eight hundred kilometres. And the first place that they hit is the East Riding's coastline. And because it's glacial till and uh, deposited around about 10,000 years ago, it erodes really easily. It's unconsolidated. It becomes really soft and it just slumps away. Um, and because the majority of the coastline is undefended, it means that actually we've got really quite a tricky, tricky job in managing all these different locations. And that's why you know, all these different officers have these different roles. So what do we do to actually manage that? Well, a big part of before we do anything is, is actually monitoring it. Um, and that's, that's done in a variety of ways. And once we've monitored that, that site, we can then think about, well, what policies can we use to um, effectively manage it? Um, and we use things like shoreline management plan, which I'll go on to. And then it's about working with that data and working with um, those policies to think about the strategies and the studies that we can um, that we can use to think about actually whether something needs defending. Once we have decided sort of whether it needs defending or not, can we um, get the funding? Because it's not easy. You know, this is a local authority. We're not the central government, so we have to apply for funding um, to, to manage some of these locations. If it's not deemed acceptable and we, we can't get any funding and we can't defend it, it's actually then a case of, well, how do these communities adapt? So how do we take these communities, engage with them and think about, well, what are their next steps? Because it could be that within a few years time, once we've spoken to them, they, can, they won't be living there. So it's about dealing with those, those issues and those, those actually really complex issues um, and using things like a, a rollback scheme. So it's sort of moving away from the, the coastal risks. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the monitoring in terms of how we exactly do it, but you know, there's there's a few different ways. Um, you know, a lot of this data is is public; it's um, released online um, on onto our website, um, and we you know it's done in really simple ways by just someone going out with a tape measure. But it can be using GPS, it can be using lidar, um, and the data is really really important because it effectively gives us that idea of actually right we need to accelerate what we need to do we need to think rather than thinking what to do in 10 years time it's now a case of well we need to do this in the next five years time and that changes all the time because we could have one year of no erosion whatsoever but then the following year we could have upwards of 20 meters of erosion depending on the environment depending on the weather depending on what's happened in that year i think you if you just you know looking at that 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 graph i mean the defended frontages that we've got, which you know, are sort of 10, 12 kilometres um, in length in total, um, where those defended frontages actually end, we have massive, massive rates of erosion. So when that defended frontage stops, it might be a groin, it might be a sea wall, the erosion rates are, are accelerated rapidly, um, upwards of sort of three, four, five metres, which is, is definitely higher than the average, which is around about two metres per year. Um, the sediment is sort of trapped at these defended frontages. The brine's trapped sediment, and because there's no sediment to go down the coast, there's no beach, and because there's no beach, the erosion rates increase. So it's really important to actually manage those locations. Now they have to be managed because they're a big town, but then there's communities that live further down the the, 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 um, the coast. So it's it's really quite tricky how you work out how that's done. Once we've got that data, um, and I have to say, it never gets any easier to basically receive that data to find out what's actually happening to some of these places. 
Um, the residents obviously are really interested in, in what that data says because they can do their own sort of data collection themselves, which they, a lot of them do. But obviously, until we do it, it's sort of classed as official. So they're really interested to see um, how it's done, what the results are. Um, and they do always ask, you know, how long have we got? And we cannot say, you know, we cannot actually give them a figure because that is never set in stone. Um, by 2025, the likelihood is that some of these streets, some of these communities will be completely gone. And they have to be gone by 2025 for some of them. Um, it will be too dangerous to leave them, um, too dangerous to leave the properties. We don't want them falling onto the beach. So we've got plans now in place by 2025 even for upwards of nearly 24 homes, some of which have already gone, um, to be removed from that coastal erosion risk. Um, by 2105, which is the last time of which any of the um, management strategies are in place, again, they're constantly being reviewed, we have upwards of nearly 237 um, houses. So a lot of people uh, at risk of coastal erosion on, on, on a, a quite a, sh a small coastline compared to some of the other big coastlines that we've got in the UK. Um, some of these locations do receive a, a lot of erosion, so it, it has to be done. Um, we can't sort of leave them to um, fall into the sea. Now, every 500 metres, each community, each location, has what we call an imminent risk line. So that's the largest amount of erosion that's ever occurred in a single event. And some of these places have received 20 meters in one night. And so that imminent risk line sits at 20 meters. So when their house or their caravan or their business falls within that line, it's a case of actually finding a, a place for that, that caravan or that house um, and for those people to move because we know then that it's potential for that to happen again. So that, that has to be um, something that we, we really proactively uh, manage in, in removing those people away from that risk. Once we've got the data, it's sort of how we use the current policies uh, and any policies that we want to develop and review um, in and actually managing um, some of these locations. Now, this obviously was adopted in 2011. This is the Shoreline Management Plan. It's a massive, massive document. It's huge. It covers the entirety of um, England and Wales. Um, and there's uh, a number of different shoreline management plans for all the different locations and they're within the sort of the sediment cells. So um, they're originally sort of planned where the, the sediment itself is sort of confined into certain locations. Um, so ours runs from Flamborough Head to um, Gibraltar Point, which is actually uh, right down at the bottom of uh, Lincolnshire. So within that location, there's a number of different policies that sort of help to manage the coastline and these are set these are set to 2,105. So how we actually manage the coastline is pretty much already guaranteed. However, sometimes they have to be reviewed and the current process that we're going through in, and a big part of what my role will be is reviewing this shoreline management plan because nothing's been done since 2011. So there needs to be a refresh of how um, this policy looks for the future. Um, it's such an important document. It uses historical data, it uses social data, economic data, environmental data. And unfortunately for a lot of the communities, it's already been decided that they will not be protected. So no active intervention, do nothing effectively, has already been decided for those locations. For those bigger towns, obviously we are going to protect and we use the whole line policy. Um, but again, it's changing all the time, different reviews, different policies. Once they get brought in, it might change just how we look at the shoreline management plans and how we use them. Um, so lots and lots of work going on at the moment. Um, and in particularly in the next year, two years, um, there's going to be a huge change in shift in how these shoreline management plans are used. Once we've got the policies, it's the case of, well, actually, what studies do we need to do and how do we secure funding? Um, for a lot of the uh, current defended frontages, it took a long, long time to be decided how to actually put them into place. Now, for a lot of them, though, they are over 100 years old. So for some of these, they're built in Victorian times, particularly those at Hornsey and Bridlington and Withensee. Um, and it would be actually quite silly just to remove them. So they're going to stay and they're going to be there for the next 100 or so years, even though they have this negative impact on the environment, down drift of, of the last groins they're going to have to stay. Now, there's lots of different ways that they're done. Um, you know, seawalls, rock armour, groins. It's all about how to do this sustainably. And, and it's not always the case of just building a massive seawall, you know, protecting the entire coastline. 
Um, and we get asked that, well, why don't you just build a huge seawall? But, you know, it doesn't it doesn't work like that because, you know, we're using things like cost benefit analysis, um, you know, thinking about the habitats that exist. The natural process of erosion actually creates some of these internationally important habitats. So without that process of erosion, some of these places that have massive, massive, you know, areas of tourism, they wouldn't be there. So that's why we have to sort of think really carefully about sort of how to manage the coastline and not just build a big seawall or put grinds up everywhere. Obviously, a big factor is it would cost a lot of money. You know, the seawalls would cost you know tens of millions of pounds. So to do something like that would would just not be worth um, the money. And it's actually a case of well, what are we protecting? You know, farmland? Are we protecting um, you know just the, just the cliffs themselves? You know, it has to take a lot of work and a lot of discussions as to to what needs to be done. Now, a lot of these are, are fairly old and, and have been in place for you know at least sort of. 50, 60 years, um, some of them even longer. But we, there has been a brand new scheme last May in 2020. It started um, and, and talks were ongoing for even years before that. And it was to extend the current uh, defences at South Woodensea. Um, now, it was a huge project because um, effectively what happened is the plan was to review the shoreline management plan in 2025. Um, and to think about well, what might happen up to 2055. But unfortunately, what was happening in that location was accelerated beyond what anyone could have, have thought of. So actually it had to be reviewed much sooner. So it was a case of, right, well, how are we going to do this? Well, there's around about 70 different properties that needed to be protected. There was um, a number of chalets and a road, and it was decided in the end that actually it probably did need to be protected a lot sooner than, than was originally planned. So what they've done is extended the, um, the rock armour um, by about 400 metres. Um, and it's now uh, now pretty much finished. Um, there's just the last, last sort of bits of work to do. Um, and a big part of what's going to happen now, and this is one of the reasons why it's being sort of accepted and the funding was given, was to actually incorporate sort of habitat creation into some of these defences. It's quite a new thing, you know, some of the existing defences that we've got, that's never happened before, you know, the original groins and the seawall, you can't do much with them. But what's going to happen now, and hopefully this is going to be this year, is actually within the rock hammer itself, is to actually design and create these little mini rock pools. Um, so when the tide comes in and out, the water goes in and then hopefully over the time, and it can take sometimes, you know, not that long, maybe up to six months, you've got a brand new habitat that's been created. Um, so we're going to work with sort of the local community and local residents and schools to sort of design some of these, um, these rock pools. Um, and they can be done in different ways from scraping to digging um, to actually placing the rocks in certain positions and certain angles. Um, and sometimes they're not actually the rocks themselves, they're sort of like these fake rocks that um, are, are sort of designed to actually you know, absorb the water and create these habitats. So lots of different ways that that can be done. The other thing that we're going to do is actually use the embankment, which is now actually really good, perfect, um, perfect soil and clay, um, and actually turn that into a habitat itself. So not just the rock hammer itself, but actually turn the cliff and the cliff top into a habitat itself and plant wildflowers um, and create a, a brand new habitat that otherwise would have been lost to coastal erosion. So it's a perfect opportunity now of sort of creating this sustainable defence, if you like, um, and utilising um, the rock armour and, and, and keeping that going. So really important piece of work that's going to happen um, in the next sort of couple of months that um, I'll definitely be involved with. Um, so sort I've of recently just reviewed sort of what's going on with that um, in the last couple of days, actually. However, a big part of, of, of what we do is, you know, isn't the management of these, these locations because there's only 11 kilometres. Um, majority of the coastline, 48 kilometres worth, is undefended. So a big part, and this is where my job comes in, is how to actually engage and work with these communities um, to manage coastal, coastal erosion and, and coastal risk. So a big part of what I have to do then is, is actually speak to these people, go to these people and think about what is the next step? Because it is already decided that their, um, their homes, their chalets, whatever it is that they live in, is going to be lost within the next five years, within the next 50 years. 
So for a number of these sites, which were once thriving communities, you know, you, you've got roads that have been completely lost um, within sometimes weeks, um, sometimes days even. Um, they, it is now a case of how do we manage that? So a massive part of my role will be uh, working with these people of, of where to go, what to do next. Um, and we have a number of different ways of doing that. Now, it really sort of started in 2009 because um, the council sort of su successfully bid for around about £1.2 million, um, which was given, um, and it was set up as the East Coast, uh, the East Riding Coastal Change Pathfinder. It's changed slightly, it's got a different name now, it's now known as, known as the East Riding Coastal Change Fund, but there's money left still to support these communities, and we do it in, a, in, a, in quite a number of ways. So some of these properties, if they're eligible, um, can be completely demolished, they can be moved to council accommodation and they will not suffer any financial burden whatsoever. Now, the eligibility though ha actually has to come to, well, did they own that property in 2009? So if they did and before that, then that is fine, they're eligible for this fund and they can be supported in whatever way is possible. So we do that. However, if some of these people have um, bought these properties after 2009, Unfortunately, that eligibility, they don't meet that criteria. Um, now, that might change. We might have a completely brand new scheme set up in the, in the next few years. But it's all dependent on how much funding that we get given. And again, we continuously lobby to government to actually get this funding because these people are at risk of coastal erosion. Um, so we try not to leave them. We don't want to leave them. Um, but actually, you know, we're always um, sort of relying on these funds to support these people. Um, now we've worked with you know hundreds of, of people over the years since 2009. I myself, you know, even since September, have worked with a number of different households now, um, engaged with them, worked out where they need to go. And some people do completely different things. People go from um, building their own properties away from the coast. Some people just completely move and go inland, you know, to other parts of the country. Um, and some people want that support and move to other coastal towns in council accommodation. So there's lots of different ways in which they sort of work with us and, 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 and move away from that coastal, um, that coastal risk. Now, I think these pictures at the bottom, I, I wanted to sort of show you really, because this is sort of the perfect example of coastal communities and, and how they can change over time. So this is um, a little, little village called Oldbury. It's actually right at the end. So the village itself is actually set back a little bit inland. Um, but there is a small community, um, not just on the main road, but also the one that's highlighted in red, um, that still lives there. Now, as you can see, in 1966, that community was quite large. And even in 2009, the size of that, that small community was, was relatively bigger, around about 10 properties. Um, but it wasn't long before coastal erosion took over. And in 2017, that community became half the size and five properties were demolished within a very short succession. And even on the main road coming into, um, into the site, you can see that a number of properties have been lost. Now, one of the latest pictures I've got, here we go, just shows, you know, even in the last few years, how much uh, erosion can take place. Um, and you can see a number of the static caravans have, have completely gone. So what's left are just the bases because it's probably not, you know, the best thing to do is to leave those static caravans lying there takes a bit of effort to move them. So the caravan site owners decided, well, I'm just gonna move them completely and we're never gonna have anyone on there again. Now in 2009, that road, campsite road was there, you know, and in, within 10 years or so, um, that's now gone, lost to coastal erosion. And obviously in the next five years or so, that community is gonna have to be engaged with about what to do next and how to work with them. Um, and I think you can just see just how close the pub has now got as well. So Double Dutch, which is the pub just there, has become really, really close to the cliff. So again, it's another huge property that we'll need to be engaged with about how to actually manage that, what to do um, with the people who live above it and, and what to do with the business itself. So um, lots and lots of work with, um, you know, loads of different people along the coastline um, in the coming months and years. Another sort of real big part of, of my role is to do with planning applications. Um, so what, I effectively have to think about is when people apply to um, 
uh, make a development in within the coast um, it's a case of well do they meet the criteria for that to be acceptable now one of the reasons i wanted to show you this was mainly because it's all about utilizing gis now it's a massive massive part of of my degree and and what i used and obviously yourselves it is a huge part now of, of lots and lots of organizations that use gis and we use it on a, on a daily basis pretty much um and someone's designed this not myself obviously but someone has designed this so gis and, and a role in gis if that's what you're interested in it can open up lots and lots of different things so the map that i've got here has got all these different colors the browns greens hatch lines there's lots of different things going on and, and each of these locations has certain criteria that if you're development falls within that has to be met and the one that i work with is the the blue hatched one so if any development falls within that hatched area there's lots of different criteria that they have to meet to prove that they are temporary or if they are um, significant to the environment or if they are a benefit to the economy and it's a massive massive part of my role and it will increase only further because um, a big thing now is obviously staycation. So a lot of people are wanting to build um, maybe new caravan sites or they're wanting to um, put new plastic caravans down. So again, that's going to be a big part of my role this year um, and going forward um, and how that changes. And again, that coastal change management area, which is the blue hatch line, that's going to move at some point. So we can't ever be certain when that location or that area um, becomes, again, further back so those 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 GIS skills everything that goes on with that it's going to change all the time and there's someone always managing that and keeping uh, keeping sure that it's up to date and, and, and really really utilizing the um, the data that we have and, and lots of historic data as well now in terms of what's next well it's really difficult to tell um, obviously climate change is, is going to be huge you know we've got sea level rise and even by two meters, let's say, um, that's going to have a massive, massive impact on these local uh, communities. Billions of pounds worth of damage, homes, businesses are going to be lost. It's, it's, a, it's a given um, and it's about how to proactively manage that and how, how we, we deal with that. And in the next five years, next 10 years, a big part of my role is going to be sort of what to do with these local communities. So it's really important that we incorporate climate change within our work. It's something that hasn't maybe been thought about that much, but now it's such a huge thing that actually, you know, things are going to be accelerated and storms are going to increase. They're going to become more powerful. Um, and because of that, there's a, there's a lot of work that will need to, to take place in how to manage some of these locations and even the big towns. You know, some of these defended frontages may have never seen a storm the size that we may get. So actually some of these locations might end up flooding even though they are protected and have been for the last 100 or so years so quite an interesting um, next few years I think for me personally so it's going to be just continued engagement with residents lots of business work as well with the um, caravans and the sites like that some huge caravan sites along the uh, East Riding coastline but also the fact that the environment and the policies will change with that the government may change what they they plan and set out to do may change but ideally it's all about adapting and being more resilient. So how do we manage the coastal change? What do we do? What steps do we have? But how do we not just bounce back, but actually bounce forward from these, these changes in the environment um, is a really, really um, important and I think exciting part of my role because I just don't know what can happen. You know, it could be that in 10, 15 years, it's a completely different job, completely different role because of something like climate change. So it's um, it's really quite interesting, really quite exciting to see sort of how these, these next few years um, really go um, within within the local authority and lots of different locations in the country as well are, are experiencing the same issues. Um, so so a lot going on with, with coastal erosion, coastal flooding um, and, and how climate change is, is impacting that. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to ask any questions go ahead labor of how you got here because i think it's really useful for everybody to see the how you got here um we know how pretty much you got here but but i think for everybody else to have a labor of that yeah i'll 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 be very brief with this i know obviously we've gone a little bit over um but i'll just sort of mention sort of how i got to here what sort of i did at uni um and sort of yeah just sort of up to now really 
Um, I think, Chan, you, you sort of gave a nice little introduction in terms of, sort of when I was at uni and um, when I graduated. Um, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, when I left university, I had a few ideas. And um, I think in the meantime, what I wanted to do was just, just to work. So I ended up working at B&Q just as a customer advisor. And I actually ended up there for around about nine months. And the reason being is because I realized it was better to take my time to think about really what it is what I wanted to do rather than rushing into something that I wasn't sure about. So I took a little bit of time just to think about that, earn a bit of money, which was, was really nice. Um, but I, I really did take my time in, in, in carefully deciding where I wanted to go. Um, that then sort of brought me on to um, becoming a, a tutor and eventually a senior tutor at the Paynell Centre, which some of you may have visited even um, if you've done geography at GCSE and A-level and things like that. Um, and that that for me was sort of my first proper career, if you like. Um, you know, it was four years or so of, of, of work. And both those jobs, both at B&Q and at Cranedale, obviously gave me some, some really important skills that I, you know, took from university into those jobs, developed them even further. Um, and, you know, that that for me was, you know, Cranedale, I couldn't, I couldn't have got that job without my degree. So again, that sort of highlighted that. And that was a um, sort of a field studies tutor doing sort of teaching geography and biology. I'd never done biology before, so that was a big shock to, to have to teach that, you know, within my first few months. Um, now, unfortunately, obviously, that that last year became um, non-existent, if you like, because schools had shut and field trips weren't happening. Um, so I, I was sort of furloughed from that work um, and I went back to being q just for a couple of months just to, to sort of work part time. So, um, I, you know, I realised my options were slowly starting to be quite limited in that sense and I didn't know what was going to happen in the future but I kept at it and I kept looking at jobs and I kept on thinking about what the future you know was going to be um, and I took the decision you know once I was offered the job at the East Riding as a coastal officer which amazingly came up you know very very rare opportunity um, for that to happen and obviously they saw something in me and, and my previous work and the skills that I had from both university and, and from my previous jobs and they took me on at the East Riding. So I took that decision then to leave um, both B&Q and Cranedale. Um, and I've been there since, since September. Um, as Sean said, I did a, a one month um, professional placement at the National Trust. Um, I also did uh, my own placement that I did off my own back um, at Biffa, which is, is on Anglesey, actually. Um, so I did that again between years two and three. So I did them both within that summer. Um, again, massive, massively important. I think they were, you know, so important to do because it gave me a flavour of work and what that was like. But it also gave me an idea of, yes, I wanted to work in some ways in the outdoors, but actually it made me decide that I didn't want to work for the National Trust or, or those sorts of organisations. Um, why? I don't know. I think it was just, um, you know, I, I, I came away enjoying it and really loving it, but I didn't want that to be my career. So I obviously looked at my, my different options. Um, there are just some of the, the modules that I, I undertook. Um, Drug Free Outdoors, which um, Sean ran, which I absolutely loved, as she knows. Um, obviously, professional placement and, and field course um, went to Barcelona. Um, oh, cool. Unfortunately, to... COVID's hit both of those. Uh, COVID okay, hit Geography yeah. Outdoors. The outdoor centres have been shut, so we've not been able to run it. And the professional placements, we've been held back because of um, all sorts of health and safety and other implications with, with government. So mm. it's not running this year. But you know, we encourage people to look at things like internships, which are available. Uh, closing dates of 5th of May. There's some possibilities there. And also, I think post degree work, I think, might be something um, to look at as well, wouldn't it, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. Can I just um, say as well, with Barcelona, we are hoping to run it virtually. So um, if anybody is interested, please get in touch with Aviana uh, as soon as possible. But we are hoping to run Barcelona virtually next semester. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I've got a little bit at the end just to mention about sort of opportunities as well, um, particularly for, for graduates. Just um, a bit of positive news, if you like. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they were the sort of some of the modules that, that sort of I had and I did and I really enjoyed. Um, for me, it was all about sort of keeping it varied, um, making sure that my knowledge was actually quite broad. Um, you know, if, if you want to focus and go down a route, that's, that's 
brilliant and, and if there's a specific interest but for me it was about actually doing the complete opposite because you know throughout uni I didn't really have a, um, a specific interest in geography I just loved every part of it um, and because of that I, I just tried to keep it as broad as possible um, but actually all those different modules gave different skills you know report writing um, critical analysis critical thinking presentation skills and all of them have become really really important in future jobs you know speaking in public um, you know, speaking just to different people, um, you know, working out problems and report writing and, and loads of different things. It's become a real you know, big element of, of what I do now as well. Um, and the other thing is sort of the fieldwork side of things. So, you know, I had a job where I was teaching people about fieldwork and I took some of those skills from the fieldwork days that we did and the trips out, which, are, which were amazing. Um, and how to process that data and the data analysis as well and data presentation. And that then became my job, you know, so I use all those skills that I got from university to actually then teach other people to do that. And I had to do that very, very quickly, you know, even after a year or so out of not doing any of those things, it had to be a case of, right, well, this is actually how you do it. So, you know, it never leaves you, you know, it sticks in your mind um, <laughs> for, for, forever, really. And, and so, yeah, you know, really make the most of all the different types of, um, of skills and stuff that you're going to learn. Um, I would say that, you know, most of the jobs even before university there's some of them I've, I've applied for and some of them that I've, I've tried to uh, apply for in between other roles as well you know a lot of asked for my degree and, and and I think it it just highlights now that you know actually they they take that on you know board and really want to make sure that because you've been to university you've got those skills and and the different skills that universities um give you I would say that the soft skills for me have been the one that I've been asked about the most as well um, so rather than you know do you know about this topic it's actually a case of well what are you like as a person you know what are you like um, working in a team or you know will you offer the help and support to someone else so those soft skills I think have become more important and more valued now in jobs than anything um, than any of the, the sort of the normal hard skills that, that we sort of learn and take from university so I think they come from those those added extras in university from just you know just being in the lectures and, and the social experience of the university um, and if you're not involved with, with some of those things you know be involved in them because a lot of those skills that I've gained those soft skills I've actually used more often than some of the hard skills that I ever learned. Um, top tips I think the top one is for me and, and, and I've now been involved in employing people as well in my last job at Cranedale, I've, I was involved in that, and that for me, top one there about being willing to do everything, I think is the most important because it's the one that I've seen managers and myself and other people I work with they value it probably the most because they know that you are there and available to offer help and support with your team and with your manager. And it's something that stands out massively. Um, and if you can do that, you know, you're always a step above everyone else because it just gives you that added extra of that you are someone who, you know, really wants to help and be, be involved no matter what it is, even if it's something that you know nothing about. And I knew nothing about biology because I didn't even do it at A level. And yet within, you know, six months, I was classed as, you know, a biology tutor. Um, within the biology team itself and I offered that I you know I, I offered that support because you know the previous biology tutor left and without that you know they probably would have struggled so offering that support has is, is been really really important. Um, obviously being confident in yourself and, and showing passion is really 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 good uh, if you show passion in anything really people pick up on that and people um, you know especially employers they they love to see you know a passion in a subject and for me, the coastal side of things has always been important to me. I've always loved visiting the coast like Matthew's done. Um, and to me, you know, because I've shown that passion to employers about working in the coast, they've seen that and, and, and it's shown a desire and, and a willingness to actually do that role. Um, and obviously trying new things, trying new jobs, not really, you know, sticking to one thing if, you, if, you, if it doesn't work out. And it's actually not feeling pressured to do that job instantly. You know, I, I left and I I didn't want to pressure myself to get something instantly. And some of my friends took a long time to get a job. 
Um, but eventually they did, and eventually now they're working in, in you know, some amazing places. And that's because they didn't pressure themselves. They just let things happen and they worked on what they were good at and eventually found something that, you know, really has given them that, that, that degree and uh, that career that they wanted. Um, so try lots of new things is, is definitely what I'd say um, in terms of uh, in terms of going forward from university. Um, what I would say is, uh, you know, just within the council and within our council itself, um, we're taking on two year um, graduates. So um, they're graduate sort of roles that are two years um, in length um, on, on something called the Graduate Development Programme, which is brand new. Um, so it's starting in September this year. Um, and that will be, I think we've got about nine or so graduates joining the council um, and that will probably happen hopefully now from, from every single two year point. And that's within the entirety of the council that could be anywhere. And we've actually successfully gained one of those graduates within our team itself, within the sustainable development team. Um, so they've, um, they've currently going through interviews and, and working out you know, people from around the country, and I think they've had around about 300 or so applicants, but that's just within our council. So there's other councils that are involved in this program. Um, and the council just doesn't, it's, that's not the only program we've got. We've got other roles as well. So even within our team, there's an apprenticeship policy officer, and she's a new graduate. So she was new uh, last year and graduated. She's now on a two year um, graduate program as well, um, which is completely different to the uh, the new graduate program. Um, we've got another officer who's, who's fairly new out of university um, and he's um, he's on, on a two year scheme as well, which is going to be uh, made permanent um, in, in the new year. And my line manager itself, he started on the graduate program and he is now, you know, managing lots of different people after doing the graduate program. So it's become really, really important. There's loads of people within the council um, who've done that. And it's not just us, you know, a lot of the large councils and even some of the smaller ones do it, do it as well. And um, so just just to sort of hopefully give you a bit of uh, positive news that actually, you know, your degree will um, definitely open up, um, up some of those avenues as well, um, because lots of people are now taking on graduates, which is, is really good, really great to see.